Lord. With you and your nation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's let's go to work. Let's go to work. So let's go to work. Let's go to this. For those of us that remain, let's go to the word of God. Disturbing topic. 
A trauma is something that has happened to you. The trigger is down the road. Something reminds you of what happened to you. And it triggers you like the event is happening all over again. Yeah. You ever talk to somebody and they're talking about remember when. And they're talking about it like it was yesterday. Yeah. But because they're still stuck back then. They don't realize that you have. Anybody ever been judged by who you were and not who you are now? Yeah. Amen. They see you how you were, not knowing that if any man be in Christ, he is a... Oh, you know, you heard that before. The old things are passed away. The old, all things. Okay, very good. Y'all, it's going to be easy today. i got two or three witnesses. Another important factor to understand mental health is to be cognizant of traumas and triggers. A generational trauma is a traumatic event that began probably decades prior to the current generation and has impacted the way that individuals understand, cope, and heal from said trauma. Feeling triggered is not just something that's rubbing you the wrong way. For someone with a history of trauma, being around anything that reminds them of the traumatic experience can make them feel like they're experiencing the trauma all over again. Now, there are two types of triggers, an internal trigger and an external trigger. An internal trigger comes from within the person. It can be memory, physical sensation, or an emotion. An external trigger comes from the person's environment. That can be a person, place, thing, or specific situation. And I'm going to give you a few of these external triggers. It can be a person connected to the experience. It can be arguing with a friend, spouse, or partner that reminds you how you used to argue with your ex, friend, spouse, or partner. That's right. It can be a specific time of day. Certain sounds that remind you of the experience. Mm -hmm. Changes to relationship or ending a relationship. Significant dates such as holidays, anniversaries, or birthdays can be a trigger if your loved one has gone on to be with the Lord. Going to a specific location that reminds you of an experience that you had that was traumatic and also smells that are associated with the experience can be a trigger for you to live the trauma all over again. Right. So let me give you just a few. There are so many uh, mental illnesses. I just want to lay out a few today and we'll lay out a few next week and then the following week. But at first I want to talk about panic attacks. All right. Oh God. Panic disorder involves frequent and unexpected panic attacks, certain periods of intense discomfort, fear, or sense of losing control, even when there is no clear danger present. Panic attacks typically come without warning. These panic attacks can occur as frequently as several times a day or rarely as a few times a year. And people who experience occasional panic attacks may not develop a panic disorder. A panic attack is not a panic disorder. Right. Pan uh, continued and prolonged panic attacks turn into a panic disorder. So because you've had a panic attack does not mean you self-diagnosed yourself as having a panic disorder. You just had a moment where life got out of control. Now, during a panic attack, you may experience a rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, sweating, trembling or tingling. Feeling of doom or imminent danger or feeling out of control, hot flashes or chills or even nausea. But just because these things happen on occasion does not mean you diagnose yourself, run to the doctor, get prescribed pills for something that you can pray with. Yes. Amen. Amen. Just, say amen. amen. Now, now, just give me a few minutes. Phobias. Specific phobia is a strong, irrational fear of something that poses little to no actual danger. There are many specific phobias, such as fear of heights. Uh, there's another, uh, uh, I found that there are phobias uh, right around our immediate circle that we have some people that are afraid of frogs. Some people are afraid of roaches. Some people are afraid of spiders. Some people are afraid of crowded rooms. Some people have phobias of closed-in spaces. All of those things that, now watch this, it has to be debilitating to the point to where you can no longer control how you feel or how you act. I have a healthy respect for heights, but I don't have a phobia of heights. <laughs> because it, it does not debilitate me flying in an airplane or standing off a balcony. I respect it. I get a little nauseous. I ain't gonna lie to you. But I will not claim that I have a phobia uh, of heights. <laughs> People dealing with phobias have a strong desire to get away. Immediate, intense fear, anxiety, or panic. 
rapid heartbeat, sweating, tight chest, trembling, or shortness of breath. Being aware of fears that aren't irrational, but feeling powerless to overcome it. Intense avoidance of an object or a situation. And children, you will find that if they have a phobia, sometimes they throw tantrums or they cling to the guardian or cry a lot because there's something that is causing them to be fearful. Now, agoraphobia is the fear of public places. Claustrophobia is the fear of closed in places. But there are also people who are afraid of driving the highway, tunnels, heights, depths, flying animals, separation, blood. There are many different things that cause people to be uh, have a phobia of that situation. Praise God. But just because you have a fear, I'm trying to separate the two, not trying to diagnose you. I'm just trying to get you to think that maybe you have a fear and not a phobia, or maybe you have a phobia and not a fear. I can't tell you. That's something you need to determine for yourself. But just because someone threw a roach on you when you were smaller and now you don't like roaches does not mean you have a phobia. That's right. Right. It may, if, if, it, if, if they come and you freeze and can't move and can't breathe and your temperature goes up 10 degrees, you might want to take a deeper look at it. But just because you don't like them does not mean that it is a phobia. Okay, are you y'all with me? Anxiety disorder. Occasional anxiety is an expectation, an expected part of life. Because you may feel anxious when you're faced with a problem at work before taking a test or making an important decision. But anxiety disorders involve more than a temporary worry and fear. For a person with an anxiety disorder, the anxiety does not go away. It gets worse over time. The symptoms can interfere with daily activities such as job performance, schoolwork, relationships, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are different types of anxiety disorder. There's generalized anxiety. There's a panic disorder. There are specific phobias, there's OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and social anxiety. That's right. Now watch this, social anxiety is an overwhelming or ongoing fear of being watched and judged by others. Mm -hmm. People with social anxiety have a fear of social situations so great that they feel like it's beyond their control. The fear may even get in the way of them going to work, attending school, or performing daily tasks. People with a social anxiety have a fear that they're being judged by the people that surround them. Amen. Sometimes it's true, but that's not our concern because people will judge you. But people with social anxiety, you see, we take it for granted that we get up, put our clothes on, brush our teeth, brush our hair, and walk out the door every day. When there's somebody literally struggling with whether or not they should get out of bed and leave the house on that day because they have such an anxiety that it prevents them from functioning properly. Let me give, let me give you one more. Let me give you one more, and then we're going to move on. Obsessive compulsive disorder. A lot of people have claimed they have OCD when they're just neat freaks. <laughs> Tell your neighbor there is a difference. There is a difference. With OCD, a person can have repeated upsetting thoughts or obsessions. They do the same thing over and over again, attempting to make the thoughts go away. Yeah. Those repeated actions are called compulsions. Researchers think that brain, brain circuits work differently for people who have OCD. It tends to run in families, and the symptoms often begin in children or teens. Left untreated OCD can take over your life. Now, some of the signs of OCD is a fear of germs or a fear of being hurt. Needing things to be in order or symmetrical. Difficulty allowing uncertainty. Dreadful thoughts about harming others or losing control. Now some of the compulsions or the actions of someone with OCD, repeatedly washing your hands, always counting items, constantly checking on things such as making sure the door is locked or the stove is turned off, repetitious cleaning, watch this, this is what separates your actions from the diagnosis. Thoughts about yelling obscenities in public places. That is someone that is diagnosable for OCD, not just because you like things neat and in order, but you walk in a crowded room and you just feel like cussing folk out. Come on, somebody. I know, and I know at times, everybody in here has felt like cussing somebody out. Amen. If you have never felt like cussing somebody out, raise your hand so I can give you the mic so you can finish preaching. At times, everybody 
has felt like yelling something, but someone with OCD has an uncontrollable compulsive reaction inside of their brain to yell obscenities or to hurt someone or to hurt themselves. So just because you don't want to touch the doorknob does not mean you have OCD, okay? Just because you wash your hands when you're in a crowded room does not mean you have OCD. Just because you like to have things neat, symmetrical, in an order, and you go over things in your mind over and over again to make sure it's correct, that tell your neighbor that's just a symptom. That doesn't mean that you are to die. A lot of people have diagnosed themselves and say, oh, that's just me and my OCD. And me tell your neighbor that devil is a lie. If that's you, stop diagnosing yourself with OCD because God has not given you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and the and sign. Even if you're having those signs and those symptoms, you want to let the word of power come out of your mouth because there's power in the words that you speak. But if you keep claiming OCD, OCD is going to find you because you put it into the atmosphere. But I wish I had at least two or three folk that would say, I don't have it. I, Everybody can raise their hand on at least one of those. The hyper 
hyperactivity involves fidget or of hands and feet. Has difficulty sitting or remaining seated. No. Runs around or climbs at inappropriate times. No. Has difficulty performing activities or tasks quietly and talks excessively. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pause there for a second because I, I knew y'all were going to start looking around. Talks all the time. So, displaying these proclivities does not mean you have the illness. But if not addressed and confronted, it can develop into a mental illness. Identification is important because you will know how to govern yourself and you will know how and when to fight. So don't diagnose your moments, proclivities, or traits, especially if it goes against the word of God for your life. Tell your neighbor, don't diagnose this moment. Oh, that was the wrong neighbor. Talk to your other neighbor. Somebody that can look back at you and go in agreement and say, don't diagnose this moment. Because everybody has a moment. Everybody has a downtrodden time. But don't diagnose the moment when God is not through with you. Y'all know the song say, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. But when God gets through with me, I shall come forth. Oh, maybe y'all don't know that. Maybe y'all don't know that. The Bible says, he that had to done a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. But he started it, so he's bad enough to finish it. I just have to deal with the middle of what God started. Oh my God, when God starts something, he's bad enough to take it to completion. We give up in the middle, and we give up on God. When I heard a songwriter say, don't give up on God, because he won't Amen. Somebody shout, he's able. I'm going to say, he's able. The more you dwell on your mental incapability, it will begin to be magnified in your mind. But how many know no one deserves to be magnified except Jesus? Oh, I got one witness. Oh, about to come magnify the Lord. Oh, yeah. Let us exalt his name together. Why? Because I saw the Lord. He heard my They 
see themselves or how they feel about themselves or how they identify or what they want to be and where they want to be. But you cannot, ask, you cannot ask me to become mentally ill when I see you how God saw you and you want me to see you how you made. I'm not bashing, I'm not saying anything, but allow me to be me. I have a certain prescription in my glasses. And if I took these glasses off, all of y'all would look alike. <laughs> but because I'm working with the prescription that was prescribed to me, I see you clearly how you are. <laughs> Everybody has perceptions, but there's only one prescription. And that's to give your life to the Most High God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let me keep moving. Let me keep moving. There is a proceeding word for your situation. There is a proceeding word. The proceeding word of God is what God is saying continuously, not just what He said then. Mental health, the words are not quoted in the Bible, but it is addressed. God's word is so fluent that it speaks to generations, not just to the people that existed in the time when the scriptures were written. So it's incumbent upon us to get a revelation of what the scriptures said and is continually saying to us. Sometimes, beloved, our minds start tripping because we know there's more to life than we're currently experiencing, but it's hard to reconcile what is with what can be. I mean, anybody ever seen your life better than where you are now? Yeah. You had a dream and vision of grandeur and greatness, but you get up in the morning and awaken to mediocrity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That will cause a struggle and conflict in your mind because the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and told you that there's something better than this. And I don't know about you, but if you ever have the Holy Spirit preach into your belly or preach into your mind, it's hard to deal with other, anything other than what God said. I live through it, but I know I'm getting through it. I'm in it right now, but I know over the course of time, I'm going to be all that God has called for me to be. And sometimes, beloved, our problems are simply fighting our purpose. The problems can be magnified if you're not cognizant of your purpose in God. But the preceding word of God prompts you to make valid and vital decisions about your life. That's right. Your decisions are affected by your capacity to understand your choices. So perhaps you don't know the preceding word of God, so just let me give you some scripture. So I tell you, neighbor, he about to give us some word. So let me give you some preceding word. The Bible says in James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So that's, that's a preceding word. Because we have to constantly and continually do the word of God. Let me give you another. Isaiah 53 and 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Come on, with his stripes we are healed. Yeah. Timothy 1 and 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and Philippians 4 and 7 says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Somebody, if anybody in here that can stand and have a little peace in your life. Oh, God, you, you can stand and have a little peace in your life. If you're like me, your mind goes on and on, and it never shuts up. And the same thing you went to bed with, you wake up with in the morning. You got sleep, but you didn't get rest, because your mind never rebooted. And every now and then, you need God to do a hard reset on your mind, so that you can get some rest at night and have just a little bit of peace. I ain't talking about peace with your situation or peace with your circumstance. I'm talking about peace in the midst of your situation, in the midst of your circumstances. Crazy peace that you don't even understand why you have peace. Anybody, anybody ever had peace that you didn't understand why you had peace? Yes. One, two, three, four, five. You don't know why you got peace. Life is still chaotic, but you have peace on the inside. All your bills are still due, but you got peace on the inside. The doctor gave you the C 
word, but you still got peace on the inside. Your family go crazy, but you still have peace on the inside. That's crazy peace that passes. Oh, y'all mean all of your understanding. Okay, well, let me give you another one. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul. Oh, even as your soul prospers. Yes, Psalm 37 and 25, my favorite. I have been young. <laughs> but now I'm old. But I thank you, brother. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Never. Never. I've never seen the righteous. This I didn't see the righteous call. This I didn't see the righteous go through. This I didn't see the righteous broke. This I didn't see the righteous sick. So I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor the children of the sea that he bring. Tell your neighbor, your children shouldn't be begging for nothing. Unless you got babies like Reverend Shadow. I can feel you. I can send my babies over to somebody's house, to their um, aunt's or uncle's house or their the grandparents' house. I feed them before they leave. But when they get there, Lord, I'm hungry. What you got to eat? I didn't realize until a little bit later, it wasn't that I fed them. They wanted their grandma's food. Right. <laughs> they were almost rather that I didn't feed them before we left. I wasn't trying to send them nowhere for them to be begging bread. Right. Same thing goes with life. If you raise your children up in the admonition and the fear of the Lord, yeah. they shouldn't be begging people for validation or affirmation. Yeah. You got a little girl, daddy's tell your little girl, you're beautiful, you're lovely, you are the pride, my pride and joy, you're everything to me. Put some money in her pocket, affirm her in her mind, so that way when little Joe Blow come lately come and tell her how cute she is, she don't melt in his arms for a happy meal. Worship works. Worship works. Real quick. Tell your neighbor, worship works. 
Okay, now after another, the other neighbor, are you a worshiper? Wait for a response, wait for a response. Are, are you a worshiper? Are you a worrier or a worshiper? When trials hit, do you worry about it or do you worship it? When things are going wrong, are you worried or are you worshiping? It makes a difference to what's going on. You see, worry does not fix a thing, just gives you anxiety about what's going on. But I'm going to skip the middle man of worry and step right into worship. Oh, worship don't mean that everything is all right. It just means that I submit myself under your authority and whatever's going on, I'm going to lift my hands anyway. I'm going to say God is good anyway. I'm going to say you're still a provider. You're still a way maker. You're still a mind fixer. You're still a heart regulator. I'm going to, I'm going to worship anyway. Worship ain't what I do. Worship is who I am. So, when I get up in the morning, I'm a worshiper. When I ain't got no money in the bank. When I don't have food on the table. On my way to work. When my boss man acting funny. Let 
Let me clarify. I'm glad you asked. Praise is more than just inaudible descriptions to God. Praise is more than just hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God. That's a form of praise. But true praise is when you call when you quote God's word back to him. That's praise to God. That's a scribing word to God. God holds himself subject to his word. So when you begin to quote God's word back to him, it don't make him any more God. It don't make him any more better. I said any more better. Forgive me. It don't make him any better. He's God before you quote the word. But God is looking for a mirror to send something up so he can see himself to send it back down. God is only blessing people that look like him. Good God Almighty. So when you send it up, you can set your clock to because it's coming back. It may not come back how you send it up, but it's coming back. You quote God's word back to him, it's coming back. That's why you got to say what the word says about your mental health. Don't say what Dr. Phil or Oprah said about your mental health because they lie to you. They don't really know. These are the scriptures in the world. You may have it, but if I were to stand here and say God can't fix a mental illness, I would be lying to you and I need to sit down and shut up somewhere. But we serve Jehovah Rapha who is a healer. Now, this claim, I'm not telling you not to go to the doctor. I'm not telling you not to take or continue taking whatever meds that have been prescribed to you. I'm not telling you that. I'm not your doctor. I'm not your physician. But I am a minister of the gospel. I do believe that there's a bomb in Gilead. I do believe that mental health falls under the parameters of God's capability to fix. And truth be told, sometimes all you need is to get in a hot service to where the Lord visited that side. I know y'all don't think so. Sometimes you just need to be in the right place. Thank you, brother. At the right place at the right time. Because there's such a thing called old glory. Anybody 40 and over know what I'm talking about? The old Pentecostal church with the hardwood floors and the hard seats and a mother's corner and a deacon's corner and ushers that had on gloves that would slap the back of your head if you had gum in your mouth. I'm talking about the old glory. I'm talking about the old anointing. The 50 people in the choir. I'm talking about the old anointing. When they had one microphone in the church and they had a passing around. When everybody, I'm talking about old glory. When they had praise and worship for 45 minutes. The glory there. I'm talking about old glory. When we used to carry up the altar for the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about old glory. When you put up on the parking lot, if you had a bottle, you put a bottle to the side and say there's glory in that house. I'm talking about old glory. In the old glory, a sinner came in but left the saint. In old glory, people on the verge of divorce came out all over each other because glory hit the house. Because worship was a part of the service. And they like, said, we can just give God to visit us. I don't know if you know, but God don't go to every church on every Sunday because some people have kicked them out. But if you ever get in one of them hot ones, I don't care if you believe in speaking in tongues or not. I don't care if you believe in falling down or not. You ever get in one of them hot services where the glory of the Lord feels comfortable there, where the glory of the Lord resides there, you will find that there will be healing in that place. Watch this. Healing ain't just for the person that fell at the altar. Healing is for the person sitting in their seats, showing it in, and saying, Lord, I know you've been so good. You can't judge my deliverance by the way that I dance. You can't judge the level of my deliverance by how loud I shout. If everybody that danced got delivered, come on. 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 Come on.
Even when you left out of church. Anybody ever been so drunk in the Holy Ghost you had to pass the key? I, I'm a pass the key. I need a designated driver. Cause I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Cause I still got. Uh, let me go to this side. Anybody ever been drunk in the Holy Ghost? To where you were staggering like you had some of that old gold. Like you had some of that Billy D. Like you had some of that Bacardi or that Scott. When I look at the way I start naming liquors. Talking about old glory when you staggering in the Holy Ghost because God has done something in your mind. Rearrange the furniture in your mind. Rearrange your thought pattern in your mind and having difficulty catching up with what the Lord did in the Holy Ghost. Tell your neighbor, he did it for a reason. Now he who the sun set free is free and he cannot go back to that yoke of bondage what the Lord delivers you from it. Every 
situation that's not like you is falling and crumbling even now as we pray. We thank you right now for power and love and we will declare it unto the heavens. We will declare it even when we don't see it. We will declare it even when we don't feel it. That you gave us power and a sound mind. But the mind that we serve the Lord. And we will serve you with a sound mind. Now henceforth and forevermore. Thank you for your healing in this place. And we love you today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 If you receive that word, amen. Amen. You don't have your seats. So we're going to transition into Holy Communion. Uh, before we do, I would open up the doors of the church if anybody desires to become a member of this local assembly. Either by watch care or full membership, the doors of the church are open. We will receive you in the name of the Lord. If you want to become a member, when you come down, we will receive you right now. Well, bless the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Huh? He broke the axe. Anybody else? We'll be up oh, there. Oh. Praise God. Bless the Lord. Two is strong, but a threefold cord can't easily be broken. Amen. Amen. What, anybody else before we? Before we close and transition to Holy Communion, we want to become a member of this crazy church. <laughs> we love the Lord, though. We love the Lord. Hallelujah. And we disseminate truth. Hallelujah. Praise God. Will you give me my people? Give us a name. Tell us about the name. My name is Nick Shane, but I'm going to be out here. I'm going to be my life and my family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And take him out here to better his life and himself. Amen. 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 Somebody tell him you made the right choice. You made the right choice. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. How are you doing? I'm James First from North Louisiana.
not delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night he was betrayed, he took bread. And he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And like manner, he took the cup. After he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do show forth the Lord's death. Father, we thank you for this together in your house and worship. Father, we thank you for allowing us to partake in the Holy Spirit. As your word says, do this in remembrance of me. So we thank you for we don't do this in remembrance of our sins or our transgressions. Of our, we know none of us can take. You said do this in remembrance of you. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity. Father, thank you for shedding blood, and Father, we thank you for giving us open access to the throne of grace. Yes, Lord. In the Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
going to say to Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. Thank you. The blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. After they ate and they drank, they went to the Mount of Olives, singing praises unto God for the things that He done. Mm -hmm. 